we have studied prophecies of the church, prophecies of Christ. We've studied an introductory lesson concerning the church. And I was beginning a, another lesson on the organization of the church, and I wanted some information, and so I did a search on my computer to find that information. And I found that I was writing up a sermon that I had preached last year. <laughs> and so I decided, well, I will wind this up with a summary on the church, and then we'll move on to something else. Uh, I don't, don't want to repeat the sermons I preached, knowingly anyway. Uh, today we will be considering an overview of the New Testament church. And while there's going to be some repetition from previous lessons on the church, we'll not spend a lot of time on those things that we've recently covered. The first thing we want to notice is the organization of the church and to realize that God the Father is the divine planner. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 9 we read, saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I want you to notice that it says that this was planned before the world began. Again, in Titus 1, Verse 2 we read, In the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And so again and again we see in the scriptures the fact that this was not just a last minute decision. This was something that God had had in his mind before man was ever created. In Ephesians, the, third, the first chapter, verses 3 through 5 we read, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us, uh, now that's this us is plural, it's referring to the church, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Notice he hath chosen us in him when? Before the foundation of the world. He planned the church and those who would be in the church to be saved when? Before the foundation of the world. He did not predestine me to be in the church. He didn't predestine you in the church. But he set aside that those who would be in the Lord's church would be those who were saved. It was God the Father who planned all of this. But it, in Ephesians 3, 10 and 11, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What? That principalities in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The church knows the manifold wisdom of God is to preach that manifold wisdom, is to grow in that manifold wisdom, and it was revealed to those people who would, who would listen and believe and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see that this is the eternal purpose of God. What? The salvation of man. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that good news. But Jesus Christ himself was the agent in this matter. He was the one through whom the Father accomplished these things. In 1 John 4, verses 9 through 10, in that he was manifested the love, and, and this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world. Why? That we might live. God sent his only begotten Son into the world because the Son would be the agent through whom his divine plan would be accomplished. Here in his love, verse 10. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God planned it, the Father planned it, it would be accomplished through the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Son, through whom it was accomplished, has all authority, and he is head of his church. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All power, now this word could also be translated authority, it's the same original word, all authority, all power is given to me where? In heaven and in earth. 
Jesus Christ holds all authority as it were. In Ephesians 5, verse 23, we read, For the husband is the head of the wife. Now listen, even as Christ is the head of the church. Who is the head of the church? It's not the pope. It's not a committee. It's not the preacher. It is Jesus Christ. The authority that elders hold is always subservient to that of Jesus Christ. They cannot delegate anything that's contrary to the word of God, whether it be God's word and in, in explicitly stated, whether it be God's word implicitly stated, whether it be a, a statement, whether it be an implication, or whether it be an example. All of these things are binding, and no man, elder or otherwise, can change those things or alter those things, take away or add to those things. And so Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5, verse 23. One other passage we want to look at along this line. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. That's pretty clear. He made the rules. He has given us the rules. In Matthew 28, verse 18, he has all authority. Going back over that, didn't mean to. In John 16, verse 13, he set the law, the Holy Spirit set the laws in motion. We read in John 16, verse 13, that Jesus told the apostles that he would give the Holy Spirit to them and that the Holy Spirit would guide them unto all truth. How were they to know what to preach? How were they to know what to teach? Granted, they witnessed many things about Jesus Christ. Granted, they heard him teach in their lifetime. But what would happen? The Holy Spirit would make sure not only to bring all things to remembrance, but to teach them everything that they needed to preach and teach. There was not a single thing left out of the revelation that, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit gave the apostles. We read in 1 Corinthians 2.13, where Paul writes, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Whenever I pick up this New Testament and I read in my New Testament, or in the Old Testament for that matter, I understand and I know that these things were not delivered to us by man. Oh, they were written by man, penned by man, I should say, but they weren't given to us by man. These things came from God through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, and in the Old Testament, through the prophets. And so we understand that these are holy things. These are the things of God. The apostles were the ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, where Paul writes, Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. Notice the change in pronouns. We are ambassadors. God beseech you by us. Who? Us ambassadors. We pray you in Christ's stead. They took Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. They were the ambassadors. One who spoke in place of, the, uh, of, a, of a ruler. One who spoke in place of a government. One who spoke, brought down the rules, brought down the, the conditions for, for that government to another government, to another people. And that's exactly what the apostles were. They were ambassadors for Christ. And they brought Christ's conditions for pardon to a lost and dying world. They spoke in Christ's stead because the Holy Spirit guided them. In Ephesians 6, verse 20, For which I am, I am an ambassador in bonds, Paul writes, he was in prison, he is an ambassador, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, some people can't give up a TV show to come and worship God. Some people can't give up their own time to read God's Word and to study God's Word. Here was a man who gave, gave up his freedom because he was placed in prison for being a preacher of the gospel, an apostle. He was indeed an ambassador who was put in bonds. There were also prophets in the New Testament church. In Ephesians 4, verse 11, he gave some apostles and some what? Some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. We read again in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps governments and diversities of tongues. 
And so we see that prophets were an important part of the New Testament church. We read of such prophets in Acts 11, verse 27, Acts 13, verse 1, Acts 15, verse 32, and Acts 21, verse 10, prophets that were in the churches during that time and that age. The prophets were instrumental in revealing the New Testament. In Ephesians 3, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as is now revealed unto his holy apostles and what? And prophets by the Spirit. So the gospel was revealed to the apostles and the prophets by the Holy Spirit. So they were instrumental in bringing this revelation to us. There were all, now those were temporary offices. Uh, apostleship as far as earth is concerned. We have no living apostles today. We have no living inspired prophets today. Jesus Christ, while he is the head, he is in heaven. That's where the headquarters are. We have their word which guides us and leads us. But we have no living men upon the earth today that has taken their place. But we do have elders. And these elders are elders in every single congregation. We read in Acts 14, verse 23, concerning Paul and, 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 the, and the group that had come back from the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, what? Elders, plural, in every church, singular. Every congregation had a plurality of elders whenever they were mature, whenever those people were ready, whenever they were prepared for elders. You can't put someone in who does not meet the qualifications. Okay, we read also, if we were to go through this, which we're not, that they're also called presbyters. Uh, that's the same Greek word as elders. They're also called overseers and bishop. Again, the same Greek word translated two different ways in various passages. They're called pastors and shepherds. Also, one single word translated in two different ways. These help us to understand the work and the position of these men who are elders. It tells us a little bit. You look at the word elder and you think of someone who's older, someone who's gained wisdom through experience, someone who's not a novice, as it were, in Christianity. And so we see that here, someone who's an elder who has that wisdom. But not just that, overseers and bishops, someone who watch over the congregation, protect the congregation, uh, shepherds and pastors, someone who leads the congregation, you say. And so we have just a little bit revealed about their work, even in the terms that are used. What is their work? Well, First Peter 5, verses 1 through 3, The elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the church of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre's sake, but of his ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Some people have taken that to the extreme and say they're only examples, which is false and untrue. We read in 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 through 5, a little bit more about this. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now listen, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So that tells us that he has to be one who's capable of ruling, one who's not just an example, but is able to rule and direct, as it were. In Hebrews 13, verse 7, Obey them that have the rule over you. Now this is speaking of elders. Now you go back to Hebrews 13, verse 7. And uh, that is, I believe, speaking of the apostles there. But here, this is definitely, there's no way to get around it. This is definitely speaking of elders. The other might be questionable. You might be able to argue either way on the other. Verse 7. But this definitely is speaking about elders in verse 17. In Acts 20, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. He called the elders. He calls them overseers here. He tells them to pastor, to shepherd the flock of God. All three Greek terms are used with reference to these men in Acts 20 verse 28. And it gives us a picture of their work. They're to feed. They're to protect. They're to shepherd the flock of God. 
In 1 Timothy 3, verse 9, we read, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. They're to hold the mystery of faith. They're to have a pure conscience in that. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. Now listen, apt to teach. He must be a person who's able to teach. I heard it. Well, I've told you this before, but you'll go here one more time anyway. I knew an elder, and the congregation was critical of him. And the reason they were critical of him, they said, well, he's never taught a Bible class. Well, I traded at the, grocery, the local grocery store there, and I generally entered through the back door. And quite often I saw Tommy Jones sitting in, that back, in, the, in a chair back there talking with men who were not members of the church. Guess what they'd be talking about a lot of the time whenever I went through there? They'd be talking about the Word of God. They'd be talking about the church, and he'd be telling them what the Bible said. Friends, that man was able to teach, and he was active in his teaching. He might not have been doing it in front of, a, of the congregation or in front of a Bible class, but he was teaching others who were outside the Lord's church, so he was apt to teach. He was fulfilling that obligation, I believe. Their qualifications are found in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13, and Titus 1, verses 5 through 9, if you want to study and read those qualifications for elders. There were also deacons in the pattern of the New Testament church, and their qualifications are found in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. A deacon is a special servant to the elders, they serve the elders. The elders can ask them to take care of this, ask them to take care of that, and they're to do so. The things that the deacons care for may be anything from those spiritual things to those material things. They may have them over the Bible class material in the sense of being under the elders but taking care of that. They may have them over the grounds. They may ask them to take care of the funds. They may ask them to be, if the congregation has a personal, active personal work uh, a program, they might have them over, one of them over that. The deacons can be over any number of things. They are assistants, servants to the elders. They serve the elders in that given congregation to relieve the elders of work that uh, others could handle. And nevertheless... They do not have a say in the work of the congregation. They do not have a say in the decisions that are made for that congregation except maybe to make a suggestion to the elders or make a request of the elders. It is the elders who have the rule in that congregation. I've been in congregations where the elders would sit down with the deacons and they'd discuss matters pertaining to the church. They'd say, should we do this or should we do that? And they'd take a number, account and sometimes you'd see the deacons voting right with them in those con some of those congregations. Friends, that's not the way it ought to be. They might offer suggestions, just like any of us can. They might make suggestions. But it's the work of the elders to make the decisions concerning the work and the worship and the edification of the Lord's church. We read of Christians in the New Testament church. All elders are Christians, but not all Christians are elders. All deacons are Christians, but not all Christians are deacons. All evangelists must be Christians, but not all Christians are evangelists in the sense of the way we use the word. And we're going to talk about all Christians evangelizing it a little bit. That is something we should be doing. What is our rule of faith? Our rule of faith is the New Testament. I believe the New Testament is I believe in Jesus Christ. If I believe in Jesus Christ, then I must of necessity believe the words found in this word, the New Testament. If the New Testament is not accurate, if the New Testament is not true, then Jesus Christ is not true. If Jesus Christ is not true, then the New Testament is not true. Both of those statements are accurate. And I might as well take this word of God and use it for a doorstop or throw it in the trash because it's absolutely no good to me if it's not true and if Jesus is not real. Friends, 
Jesus is real. The Word of God is true. It's been proven over and over. And we read in Hebrews 12, verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. It is a new covenant, and we're under that new covenant. And Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. It is our rule. It is our agreement. It is what we must hold to. In Hebrews, the 8th chapter, verse 6, we read, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Yes, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is the mediator of the covenant that we follow. And that new covenant is given to us here. It is a rule of faith. It is an agreement, as it were, given to us by God. In Galatians 1, Verse 8 and 9, we know that any changes to that covenant will bring damnation. For there Paul wrote, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's pretty clear, pretty plain. The new covenant is binding. It is indeed our rule of faith. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 8, 19, and 20, we see a picture of the work of the church in Christ's message to his apostles. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus said, go. He said, teach. He said, baptize. And then he said, teach them some more. <laughs> Keep on teaching. P continuous action. From the beginning, clear up continuously. What are you to teach them? Well, you're to teach them about country and western music. We talked about that in Bible class, didn't we? You're to teach them about how a spider makes its web. You're to teach them English and how to diagram sentences. You're to teach them secular history and politics. No. You're to teach them the Word of God. You're to teach them the Gospel. In Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus, in another account of this great commission, said, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. What did he say? Go ye and preach the gospel. That is our mission. That is our purpose. That's our work, to preach the gospel. We can preach it by voice. We can preach it by literature. We can preach it on the radio, the internet, or TV. Or we can stand on the street corner with a bullhorn and shout it out. Preach the gospel is the message that we have from our Lord and Savior. Granted, in these accounts, he's speaking to the apostles, but we're going to see something in just a moment. In Luke 24, verses 45 through 48, Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ, to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance or remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. But we're still preaching that same thing, aren't we? Repentance and remission of sins. In John 20, 21 through 23, Jesus said to them the fourth account of the Great Commission, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send I you. What did he say? I'm sending you. Is that what he did in the other three accounts that we saw? Now he's saying, I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. I believe that's a prophecy of the Holy Spirit coming in Acts, the second chapter. And then he says in verse 23, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. How are they to do that? Through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When people hear the gospel, they will either accept it or they will reject it. And that's going to make the difference as to whether people's sins are remitted or retained. In Acts 8, verses 3 and 4, Saul made havoc of the church 
And we read in verse 4, They therefore that were scattered abroad from Jerusalem went everywhere preaching the word. Now this wasn't the apostles that went forth preaching the word. Who was this that went forth preaching the word? This was everyday Christians just like you and I. That's a part of Galatians, the 6th chapter, verse 10. We have opportunity, let us therefore do good unto all men, chiefly those who are of the household of faith. We're to preach the gospel. That's doing good to all men, isn't it? We edify one another whenever we preach it, and then we teach others so that they can be saved. That's doing good for them. But what is the work of the church besides that? Well, as we look at evangelism, we understand that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, we read, If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Friend, it is not the work of our colleges to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. It's not the work of our preaching schools to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. It's the work of the church to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. And that is the fact of the matter. These other things may give us tools that we can use. They may be beneficial if they're good and sound. But it's the church that stands for the truth. And whatever the church becomes the tail for the preaching schools, when the church becomes the tail for the colleges, when the church becomes the tail for evangelistic efforts, then, friend, things are turned backwards. I know people who will stand for their school, who will stand for their college, who will stand for their favorite evangelistic program over the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're offended and angry if you say anything to show that those things are not teaching the truth, a particular one. Friends, we need good colleges for our sons and our daughters. We need preaching schools that are sound, to produce sound preachers. And we need evangelistic programs to teach the gospel to the whole world. Nothing wrong with those things. I believe that that's right and proper. I don't believe the church needs to be building colleges. Don't misunderstand. But these things can be good when they're built by brethren. But let me tell you something. A college, a preaching school, does not have the right to establish a congregation. I've heard of colleges planning congregations. That's not the work of the college. A college is to educate, not to plant congregations. It's not to be the church. It's not to be a missionary society for the church or anything like that. And we need to get back to our basics of what the Bible teaches about this. It is the church. When the church is not the pillar and the ground of the truth, neither will be colleges run by our brethren, neither will preaching schools run by, el by congregations, nor will anything else. Get back to the Bible. Let the church do what it's supposed to do. Edification is a work of the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12, they were misusing their miraculous gifts. And Paul is rebuking them for that. It says, Even so, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the what? Edifying of the church. And that still applies to us today. There's congregations that think that we ought to have skits. There's congregations who are putting their, their trust in having drama in the pulpit. There's congregations who think that the church is all about entertainment and social activities. Friends, we need to get back to edifying the church. We read in Ephesians 4, verse 16, that all of these, these offices that Christ has put in the church and the miraculous gifts he gave during the first century was to make increase of the body under what? The edifying of itself. That word edify means to build up, as it were. Build up the church. Build itself up. There's one other passage I wanted to mention, and that tells us how that is done. In Acts 20, verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to do what? Build 
you up. That word means edify, to edify you and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. It's the word which builds us up. We could go bowling all day and not be built up spiritually. We could play baseball all day and not be built up spiritually. We could go skating and not be built up spiritually. We could have parties and, and good times and play checkers and dominoes and all that kind of thing. I almost said bingo, but somebody might think I was talking about gambling. <laughs> Backed up on that one pretty quick. But the thing is, it's God's Word, not these this stuff that people are calling edification today. I once talked to a preacher. He is having a, that congregation was having a youth rally. I don't remember youth rallies. Used to have them. Some of them were good. Some of them weren't so good. And uh, they advertised in the flyer they set out that they were having a Disney movie after the devotional part of the, the youth rally. Well, I had a chance to visit with him. And I said, this movie you're having, is this uh, uh, paid for by the individuals or does this money come out of the church treasury? He said it comes out of the church treasury. And I said, well, do, is it evangelism? Is it edification? Or is it benevolent? He said, well, we look on it as a part of our outreach program. <laughs> Imagine how you can change the word from evangelism to outreach and do other things. Isn't that something? It didn't fall into any one of those three, and he knew it. And so he changed the term. How is evangelism done? Preaching the gospel. How is edification done? Preaching the gospel. It's done through the word. And friends, how terrible it is to take money that's given to do the Lord's work. That, in essence, is given to the Lord. And then take it and consume it upon our own desires. It's not right. It's work, benevolence. Evangelism, edification, and now benevolence. In Acts 11, verses 27 through 30, and in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelt at Judea, which also they did, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. You notice, went to the elders... The disciples gathered it together. Now, it doesn't give us the specifics of thinking of how they gathered it together, but I know this. I know at some point it's put into a common treasury. And so it had to be sent by the hands of, of these people, but it had to go to that common treasury first. It had to be collected. And so knowing that and understanding that, we need to consider another scripture or two. And that's 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4, which has to do with another example of benevolence. This is where the poor among the saints were in need. The American Standard Version, Romans 15, verse 26. But 1 Corinthians 15, 16, verses 1 through 4 says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, that's the poor among the saints in Jerusalem, is I have given order to the churches of Galatia, who did you give the order to? The congregations. Even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in stores. God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. What? Have it all gathered together. Have it in a store. Have it in your treasury. And when I come, whosoever shall, ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Romans 15, 26, I mentioned it earlier. This is dealing with the very same event. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Archaea to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. American Standard Version has poor among the saints which are at Jerusalem. And so we see this. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, these two chapters deal with it as well. And again, Galatians 6, verse 10, which we mentioned in reference to Evangelism also applies to benevolence. 
We have therefore opportunity, let's do good unto all men, chiefly those who are of the household of faith, giving preference to them. Worship. Let's talk about worship. In Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29, I'll tell you what. I believe that I don't have a whole lot left, but at the same time, I believe that I'm going to just drive the pin down right here on this slide, and we'll take that up uh, in our afternoon uh, in our afternoon study uh, and uh, our afternoon service. So we're going to draw the line right here, and I do want us to. Uh, recognize the church which Jesus Christ built. It's so important. Jesus left us a pattern. You can search till you're blue in the face and you won't find the Catholic church in the Bible. You can search till you're blue in the face and you won't find the Baptist church or the Methodist church or any of these denominations that you find today. Many times you won't find their name, but even if you find the name that's found there, such as the church of God, you won't find the pattern that they're following and the teaching that they're following there, which makes them a denomination and not the church that Jesus built. You have to search for the pattern. See what the New Testament people did. See how they worshiped. See what the work was of the church. And then if we simply go back and we follow this, you and I will be the church with Jesus. Perhaps... You know enough about the church and you've never obeyed it. You never come to Jesus, rather. Never obeyed him. Never, never had your sins taken away by his blood. And you need to know what to do in order to be saved and be added to his church. The first thing that you must do is hear the gospel. Jesus said, go ye to all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Why? So people can hear the gospel. Romans 10 Verse 13, how shall they hear without a preacher? We have to have preaching of the gospel. We need it. We must have it. And not only that, but we must also believe that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God. In Romans 16, verses, in Matthew, Mark 16, verses 16, excuse me, please. Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that what believeth and is baptized, faith is necessary, shall be saved. It's got like an addition problem. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. Oh, there's some other things in there. You've got some letters like X, C maybe. What do these amount to? Well, faith. You must repent after you believe. Repentance is so important. In Acts 2, verse 38, Peter preached repentance. Whenever the people asked, what must we do? He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of your sins. What is necessary for remission of sins? Well, in the, Peter told them to repent. And it's just as important today that people repent. But that's not the end of it. Confession is necessary. Whenever the Ethiopian eunuch heard Christ preached, he came up, they came upon water. And Philip, and Philip was asked by the Ethiopian eunuch, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now Philip didn't tell him, Well, you've got to wait till we can meet and vote on you. Philip didn't tell him, Well, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, you're already saved. And, and you, can, you can be baptized any time you want to be. What doth hinder me to be baptized? By the preaching of Jesus Christ, he knew he needed to be baptized if he was going to be saved. He felt the urgency for it. He saw water, and he wanted to be baptized right then. Why don't people want to be baptized today when they learn the gospel and they believe in Jesus Christ? and they repent of their sins. Why do they want to put it off? The Ethiopian eunuch didn't, and Philip didn't make him. He didn't encourage him to wait. He didn't even encourage him to wait till all of his relatives and friends could be there, did he? Philip said, If thou believest, thou mayest. 
And the Ethiopian eunuch confessed, saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Same confession Peter made back in Matthew 16, 18 and 19, that thou art the Son of God. The fact is, we must confess Jesus Christ, just as that Ethiopian eunuch did. And what must we do else? We must be baptized. I suppose one of the clearest scriptures along that line is 1 Peter 3.21. After talking about how the people were saved by the waters of the flood, Peter writes, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. You can't get around that. That's just as clear and plain as it can be. You can try to wiggle under it. You can try to, try to dig under it. You can try to walk around it. You can try to climb over it, but you can't. That's a wall there that you cannot get around or over or under. You have to go through it. Because Peter said, Baptism doth also now save us. He goes on to say, it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, it's not a common bath. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. I'm going to stop that verse right there for now. But the point is, we must be baptized. If we're going to be saved from our past sins, if God is going to add us to his church. We read in Acts 2, verse 47, when the people gladly received his word, they were baptized. Acts 2. 2.42. I wanted to get to Acts 2.47. In Acts 2.47, those who were of those who were baptized, we read, and the Lord added them to the church such as were being saved. American Standard Version. The point is, if you want to be in the Lord's church, the church we read of in the Bible, then you need to obey the gospel, and that includes baptism. If you're subject to the invitation of our Lord and Savior, you have a wonderful opportunity to come to Him while together we stand and while we sing.